So, new year, new you, right? This is the year that you're gonna go ahead and take out that old guitar from your closet, you know, the one that your parents got you that you didn't like that much because it didn't sound anything like the songs they wanted to learn how to play because it had nylon strings on it. But now it's time that you've decided that you're gonna learn some classical guitar and you're just wondering if it's too late. In this video, I'm gonna tell you one, that it's definitely not too late, you can start at any point, but also I'm gonna give you some things that you wanna know before you get started and talk about some things that most videos won't talk to you about. So, let's get started. So the first thing is just gonna be the different supplies that you need. And you know, I'm not gonna go that much into detail on these because there's tons of other videos out there you can just look up. But because you're already here, I'm gonna go ahead and give you a quick rundown anyway. So obviously you're gonna need a guitar. Now when it comes to getting your first guitar, if you don't have one already, I would highly recommend to put in at least $200 into it. Now you might be able to find one used for a better price, but if you can't, buying a new one, you're gonna to wanna to be in that ballpark. The reason why is because you want one that's gonna sound good and also play good. The worst thing that you could do to yourself when first starting to try something is get something that's just unplayable or just sounds not that great. You could be doing everything right, and if the guitar isn't able to do it, it's still not gonna sound that good, which is probably gonna be pretty frustrating. So I would recommend to buy something that you know is gonna play good and sound good. Now the next thing that you're gonna need would either be a footstool or a guitar support of some kind. Now a footstool you may have seen before, it looks something like this over here, and what it does is it just lifts up your left leg so that way you can hold the guitar correctly. We'll talk about that later. And guitar support does pretty much the exact same thing, but instead of lifting up the left leg, it actually rests on your leg or rests on the guitar and holds it up for you. And there's a few different options. There's one that looks like a comma over here. There's one that kind of clips onto the guitar and holds it up on its own. And there's even one that's a piece of glass that clips onto the back of your guitar and then just rests on your leg. So the next obvious, but maybe not so obvious thing would be having a correct kind of chair. So having a chair that's number one is the correct type, but also the correct type is gonna be really important. So yes, obviously like any kind of guitar playing, having a chair with arms is gonna be pretty inconvenient just because it's gonna get in the way of your arms when you're trying to play. But also having a chair that's the correct height is gonna be, yeah, definitely pretty important and this kind of goes along with the whole thing with the guitar support as well. So in selecting a chair that has both of these things, I would highly recommend just to get a piano bench. Even the cheaper ones should have some way to change how high or how low it is. And the nicer ones have those fancy things where you can turn it and make it so it goes exactly how you need. And neither of them should have arms in them. So if you get a piano bench, you should be good. The final thing that I'm not gonna give you an exact recommendation on would be just a method book. And the reason why is because there's so many and every teacher has their own preference. And with any of the good ones, whether it's Frederick Node, Aaron Shearer, Chris Parkening, or the Duncan method, you know, they're really all gonna tell you the same kind of thing. So you can't really go wrong with one of them. The big thing that all of these methods have in common is that they're going to want you to learn how to read music. So that's what I would recommend to do, maybe even before you start playing. Go onto the website musictheory.net and select the note identification trainer. I'll put the link down below, but the link is also gonna be right here for you. And just do it as much as you can. It's really easy, it's free, and trust me, when you go ahead and start learning how to read notes on the guitar, half the work is gonna be already done for you and you're gonna know how to find the notes. All you need to do is figure out then how to play those notes on the guitar. And final thing, before I get to the parts of the video that aren't talked about that much, and that would be just knowing some basic terminology. First thing is gonna be the left hand. We're gonna number the fingers. If you play guitar already, you know this, but one, two, three, and four. The thumb doesn't get a number. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna give the right hand finger names. We're gonna go P, I, M, A. Unfortunately, we don't really play with a pinky at all, at least not in the beginning stages of guitar playing. So because of that, I'm not gonna tell you the name of it because it's just one more thing to worry about. Anyway, let's get to the stuff that most beginner method books don't talk about. And the first thing would be the idea of nails versus no nails. So as you guys may or may not know, most professional guitar players do use nails when they play. Actually, I take that back. All professional guitar players use nails when they play. I can't think of one currently who doesn't, but of course if there is, then yeah, you guys know what to do. Leave it in the comments below. So yeah, playing with nails definitely is gonna give you a louder and a better sound, and personally I do think it'll be a little bit easier as well. But it is also a big change, especially if it's something you're not totally sure that you wanna do forever. So what I would recommend though is I would say don't use nails in the beginning. And this is something that many teachers might disagree with me on, but I'd rather have people start playing and giving it a shot than not playing at all just because of that one thing. And honestly, I have a handful of students right now who aren't using nails at all, and you know, they still sound pretty good. Now, if you wanna use nails, then yeah, go ahead, but I'm just letting you know that I don't think you have to, at least not in the beginning stages. Now, this next thing is one that I find kind of odd that isn't talked about that much in classical music pedagogy, you could say, and that would be the idea of listening. You know, in other kinds of music, especially ones that you learn by ear, such as jazz, rock, or blues music, listening is huge. So why don't we do the same thing? Maybe not the picking off from record stuff, but trying our best to copy what we hear. 
And that's why I'm going to talk about this part right now. So listening, I think, for classical guitar is super important. And what I'm going to tell you is I'm going to give you five names people that you want to listen to. These aren't my top five favorites, but they are names that you should know and sounds that you should be familiar with, partly because they're all pretty different from each other as well. The first one that I want to tell you would be John Williams. And sadly, no, this isn't the composer, but it would be pretty cool if the guy who wrote Star Wars was also one of the best classical guitarists ever. But anyway, John Williams has pretty much recorded everything you can imagine for the classical guitar, at least any big major work. And he plays with such technical precision, he has such a good sound, and many people think he's one of the technical best players ever. And you can find his music on Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, all that stuff. So check out John Williams. Now in contrast to John Williams, the other person you want to check out would be Julian Bream. Julian Bream, just like Williams, has recorded pretty much everything, whether it was modern, old, classical, romantic, all of that stuff. Julian Bream is probably known as one of the most expressive players ever. And expressive in his own way, I want to say. So much so, sometimes he wasn't as technically accurate as he could have been, but he always got his musical idea across, which is why he's probably known as one of the best guitarists. Now, the next two I want to tell you about would be two of my personal favorites, and that would be Manuel Barreco and David Russell. Both these guys are so good. They have such good tones, such good technique, and they've also recorded pretty much almost everything. They've recorded a few different things from each other, which is kind of nice, but they both sound so good, and they both have done so much for the guitar, so definitely go ahead and check both of them out on whatever platform you like to listen to music on. And the final one isn't one of my favorites, but he is definitely one that I think we have to mention, and that would be, of course, the great Andres Segovia. He's pretty much known as the father of the classic guitar because he's the reason why we have the instrument the way we have it today. Without him, we probably wouldn't have nearly as many people writing for the guitar or as many big name players as we have today. And the reason why is just because he kind of started it all. He was the one who made the guitar go from this instrument that was just playing people's homes as a fun thing that people did in social gatherings to being played on concert stages around the world. So whether you like his playing or not, we definitely owe something to him. And because we owe something to him, the least you can do is go ahead and check out some of his recordings because to be fair, they are pretty good. The other thing that most method books won't talk to you about that much is just how to practice, at least how to practice effectively. I find that this is something that many beginners really struggle with and also get pretty frustrated with. And you know, I don't blame them. It's pretty frustrating to feel like you're putting a lot of time into something and you're only getting a little bit in return. So let's talk about some things that we can do to possibly avoid this. The first thing that I'm gonna tell you is to be consistent with your practice. It's a lot better to put in 10 or 15 minutes every day for a month than to put in maybe an hour on the weekends and then have no practice during the week. What happens is you put in all that time, but then during the week, during those five days that you don't practice, all of that work pretty much just kind of goes away and you're back to the beginning on the weekend again. So be consistent. The next thing I would say to do, many people hate, even if you're a professional guitarist, and that would be just to record yourself. Find a way to track your practice. Listen to your recordings and see what you need to work on. Pay attention to your tone. Pay attention to your rhythm. Pay attention to your note accuracy and all that good stuff. The next one goes hand in hand with recording, and that would be because most people also hate doing it, but that would be just playing for other people. You know, you're never gonna get over playing for someone else if you never play for someone else, you know? And that's kind of the whole idea of this. You wanna get rid of those fears early on, and plus sometimes the positive reinforcement from somebody else just telling you that they like what you're doing is enough to help motivate you to keep on going to do the next hard thing. And trust me, it's a lot better off doing this early on than trying to do it later when you're playing this long, crazy hard piece and you've never played for anybody before because that is much more nerve wracking. When it comes to having a good practice mindset, the other thing that you want to do is just set goals for yourself. You know, don't just sit down and just play the guitar and see what comes out. Plan out what you want to do. Figure out what you want to accomplish by the end of the week or maybe even by the end of the month and figure out, well, how am I going to get there? And finally, the last thing I'll say in terms of practice is just know that beginners play beginner material. Don't be discouraged if you're playing little folk songs like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star or Lightly Row or Song of the Wind because yes, those might be kids' folk songs, but you're a beginner and these are beginner songs. If you keep practicing and working hard, you'll get to those harder songs, but don't get to those too soon, because if you do, you could maybe even put in some bad habits that you're playing that might be even harder for you to fix down the line. Take your time, don't be frustrated if you feel like you're learning easy stuff because the harder stuff will come before you know it. Anyway, if you're new to classical guitar, I hope that you found this helpful, and I hope that you really go ahead and give classical guitar a try. It's pretty fun, if I do say so myself, and it's not as hard as it might look. If you're new to classical guitar, definitely go ahead and leave some comments down below. Let me know if you found this video helpful. It is something that I wanted to do for a little while, and I figured the best time to do it would be at the start of the new year, when many people are trying out something new for the first time. And if classical guitar is that thing for you, then that is great. I hope that you go ahead and keep on pursuing it and you guys subscribe to the channel because that's what this channel is about, is classical guitar stuff. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.